and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Uh, today it's another uh, revisit show. We are going back to speak to Mike Powell of Rapid Edition, who we spoke to last in the summer of 2020. A lot's changed since then, uh, loads of different things and, and different uh, marketplaces that we're looking at. But uh, let's recap at the start. Mike, how are you? Good to see you again. Looks like you're well. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and Rapid Edition for those who didn't catch the first one. Yeah. Hey, hey, Toby. Good to see you again. Um, yeah, still still here. Haven't, haven't moved much. <laughs> um, yeah. So Mike Powell, CEO of Rapid Edition. So, you know, hopefully some of your listeners know us. We are um, uh, an electronic trading enterprise platform company. Um, we, we basically provide the uh, core underlying infrastructure for uh, pretty much any electronic trading workflow kind of cross asset class working with uh, buy side, sell side, liquidity platforms and exchanges around the world. And so it's, it's a really interesting business. And, and, and I think we said last time, one I've known for, uh, you know, for, for, for some time and the sort of uh, evolution of it has been, been really interesting to watch and, and you coming in, obviously you know, walking into some, uh, you know, to, to, to some macroeconomic challenges over, over the course of the last year. Last time we were, we were speaking, it was all about sort of adapting to the situation and say, you know, we were probably a, a lot less clued up for one of a better expression as to, as to what was lying ahead of us. Tell us a little bit about how, how you and the team have, have fared over the course of the last uh, six months to a year. Yeah, yeah, sure. Look, I think I think all firms have, have learned a lot um, over the last 12 months. I think we spoke probably last summer. You know, I joined in June 2019. So, you know, I'd kind of just been getting my feet under the table and, and we're thinking about sort of business plans and outlook for 2020 and then the whole COVID thing hit, as, as everyone knows, right? But um, so, yeah, it was it was as we discussed last time, it was it was super challenging. I think, you know, that Q2 last year just you know went kind of radio silence i think yeah everybody all our all our clients prospects and so on um suddenly went very internal facing you know they had to sort themselves out they had to kind of work out how they were going to operate through this so mm. yeah so i think um so spring summer last year like for most firms it was you know it, it was a little bit tough and people were sort of wondering what was going on um, but but also like thinking very hard about how does how do how do we operate um you know you, you know, you can't go and see people, you can't go out to conferences and so on. So yeah, it was, it was a big adjustment, but I, th I think it was, it was kind of interesting, actually, it, it presented an opportunity as well. So um, I think a lot of firms, you, you kind of go through the motions, you, you kind of turn up at various events, you have your way of pitching clients, you have your sales material, you have your story. Um, I think it gave us a little bit of a, a fire break to um, really step back and think around how, how do we go to market? For instance, you know, really, we, we kind of actually we re relaunched our website last year. We, you know, as I mentioned last time, we did a, a major product launch that we had um, lined up for um, end of Q1 anyway, and we went ahead with that and really refocused our whole marketing efforts um, around mm -hmm. sort of digital, online, refining the messages, trying to do more thought leadership um, type articles. Yeah, just interesting things to keep people in kind of engaged while. The world was sorting itself out and yeah. so so that that was actually an opportunity for us and i think a lot of good came out of that and i think we're much tighter now in terms of what we're trying to do who we're trying to work with um what's our key messaging and so on to the point that you know i, I think a lot of that's we're going to sustain going forward so um, without wanting to be too controversial you know i'm thinking very hard at the moment around you know what the value of face-to-face -face events how will how will they come back and you know, I think a lot of firms like us spend, you know, tens of thousands of pounds every year, if not more, on sort of flying people around the world to these uh, you know, kind of events and trying to swap business cards and having a little booth and maybe wheeling me up on stage from time to time, you know. And um, yeah, you know, is is that is that best bang for buck in terms of, of marketing spend? Um, so I think that's one consideration. I think the other thing I've noticed is everyone went, you know, everyone's doing similar things, right? So LinkedIn um, got super busy um, and some, some great stuff posted, some, some stuff pretty average and some people started to using, using it like a sort of Facebook or some, some other kind of social mm -hmm. media um, type platform, which, you know, I, I guess my personal view is that's not really what LinkedIn's for, but there you go. 
but it got kind of crowded. So, so there's almost a bit of a 2.0 rethink going on at the moment around how, how do you leverage that? You know, what is your, your digital marketing strategy? But you know, the, the big shift I think is, is people have got so used to um, online meetings now, you know, be it team, zoom, whatever, whatever you use that that then raises the question of what does the world look like going forward you know um how how easy is it to kind of arrange for everybody to be in in town on the same day and yeah. and do we end up having a much more sustainable kind of online interaction with clients which you know there's efficiencies to do that there's definitely some some downsides of, of, of doing that as well in terms of building relationships and so on but but i think that that kind of blend going forward um yeah we've talked about before of what does the workplace really look like afterwards and is everyone going to rush back to five days a week uh, mm -hmm. much as goldman sachs would like to if you read that yeah article. yeah uh, i love that that's, a, that's an amazing article wasn't yeah it? yeah they might Aber struggle. Aber Aber aberration wasn't it <laughs> yeah it yeah that? you know which is, which which is fine and each firm and, and i can understand that to a certain extent but i think the world is permanently shifting i think you'll struggle to to attract a lot of younger talent out of university, um, if, if that's what you're doing. I mean, my, my daughter's just started at Deloitte. She graduated last summer, mm. and obviously she's working from home at the moment. And I, you know, I, you know, I, th I think a world where they go in maybe three days a week and work from home a couple of days a week. Yeah, I'd love to have had that when I started my career, rather than having to be at a desk at seven thirty yeah, yeah. every day. Yeah. Um, so it, I do, also, I do, I do also wonder about that. I mean, it's a really interesting aspect, isn't it? Because yeah, there, there is. There's there's a lot of people who are who are saying that, but um, you look at it and say, right, would you have wanted to, to have that at that age? And um, and, and I think we, we sort of make some assumptions around around that. But also, there was an awful lot that you know when, when I think of my, my early twenties and and starting to work up in the city, about just how much fun it was to you know to be up there and to be doing that on a day by day basis. Yeah, and it, it's going to be very very interesting to see that when you know, when confidence returns for people to come back into the city and there is that sort of thriving aspect as to whether that is something which, you know, we assume the younger generation are, are looking for and whether that would be, you know, great or whether actually, you know, thirsting for that connectivity and that interaction with the break that we've had, which is going to be one of the great unknowns of, of what we're looking at. And then you look at some of the big companies and as you say, Goldman Sachs, I think there's some fairly outspoken uh, conversation at KPMG, which cost the might have cost a job as well <laughs> um uh you know with, within that that's that sort of that sort of area about you know whether the large companies have got a friend who's going to be going back and and i know his bank are very very forceful you know, he's had a years years career break going back into it and his, and his bank are very very forceful about people coming back into the city that then dictates because look the uh you know the, the trade shows have, have always been dictated by who's going to be there from a from a buyer perspective and if you've got you know the, the the sort of iron fist coming down to the banks saying right we're back in the office and that's where we go that that dictates to an extent where the service provider industry then then has to to move to so it's going to be very very you're, you're right it's very interesting but i think it can go one of one of two ways i think there is this ability to say right can we learn and be better from everything we're looking at but alongside that it's it's there's going to be a very very strong pull to to over a fairly rapid acceleration go back to something near the norm and it's going to be the discipline of companies who are saying, actually, there is a better way of doing this. That's going to be really interesting to. Yeah, I, I just hope that, we. That exactly. And I, I mean, you know, one would hope we move to a bit more of a balance. I um, think that's the answer, yeah. Where, 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 you know, people can have a little, a little bit more flex, flexibility. Because I think the other thing that's changed radically is the kind of, you know, from a glass half empty perspective, I guess, the intrusion of, you know, male chat text what's yeah. up, what, whatever from from a work perspective because although you know when we kicked off we were working you know long hours and you had to be in early but when you went home you went home yeah you know? um i mean i worked at, at, at namura and i think we had to take a copy of the orders home in case um there was some error that got processed over overnight in in you know, tokyo needed to question a ticket if they couldn't read the writing or whatever so we'd have to take it in turns but other, other than that you know being on that rotor you, you finished you went home whereas yeah, yeah. you know it's a bit it's a bit it's a bit more pervasive now um with, with electronic media right i was having this conversation actually and it's uh i think it's very easy to sort of sit there and and, and have an in my day conversation about this sort of stuff i mean we uh when i when, when i in my day when i first got into the industry we would be in a uh 
sort of seven thirty, eight o'clock, and you'd be at your desk at seven thirty, eight o'clock. People love, like to point at snowflake generations and all this sort of stuff. It it is a quieter and earlier ending time, and there's not an awful lot you can do to force that. That's it, and, uh, other than get presenteeism and and you know very high churn ratios if that's what you're going to insist on. But what you forget is that with that connectivity, you know, when I'd finished and you went home or you went to the pub no one was going to be able to reach you at that sort of stage to then talk about that. You weren't going to get your emails and be responding to them just before you went to bed or when you're just waking up. You know, you had to be in the office to be connected. And, yeah. and that sort of blurring of the lines, particularly with the last year, is going to be really interesting to see, right, okay, let's make sure we've got that balance right for people to be able to perform consistently rather than just dragging it out. So it's a very, very interesting, I mean, it, it's a it's a topic that I could spend hours on and, and really dive into. And I know you guys have done a good job with uh, with keeping that continuity as many companies have uh, within it as well. I want to move back a, a, a slightly there as well, because I think you know, one of the things I really want to shine a light on with, with what I think you've achieved over the last year, is, and I've been watching it and seeing it, is the quality of content has been exceptional that's come out of there. And I know that was something which you were talking about and thinking about and really wanted to get right. So it's very interesting for me as, as someone who's coming with your you know, stellar experience in the industry, coming into to this, this job and saying, right, okay, it's a, it's a, um, it's a really interesting business and always, always has been in, in the space. You're there in, in two, you know, summer of 2019, you get six months under, under your belt and then the world starts to get turned upside down. And that uh, aspect of saying rest, pause, uh, let's have a look here about what we can do better I think has been one of the great opportunities of, of, of a very difficult time. And there's companies there who, who maximize that. And there's companies there who, who've sort of almost missed the opportunity and tried to weather, weather the storm. And, I, and I'm, I've been really, um, really impressed from the outside looking in about the sort of content that you've been doing, the, the continuity of the content, the value that's been trying to add. And if we look here at rapid edition, having been included in the, you know, the financial technologies magazines, most influential companies of, 2021 which which i'm delighted to see you guys in there one of the common traits of all those businesses that are, that, that will be listed uh, and bear in mind the judging panel of lloyds and ey and, and Beringa and all these sort of businesses have looked at this from a from a sort of detached viewpoint i think when, when we when we and it's a big it's a bigger list than it's been ever because i think there's so many companies that have done some amazing things in it this year is, and I think it's such an important year to have this listing is you, in, and you look for common denominators in it. So my job is to basically look at all of those businesses who are listed and say, right, what's the, what's the golden thread? What's the similarities within it? And if I speak to any company that I think has grown revenue, grown headcount, um, added value, add, added value to, the, you know, to, the, to themselves and their business and move further forward, it attracted investment. They've been companies that have been very, very marketing savvy and they didn't uh, panic. They didn't sell, sell, sell. They looked at it and said, right, how can we be um, empathetic to this industry? How can we add value to this industry? And how can we put content out there that's going to really engage it? And uh, I remember the, the CEO of uh, Metro Bank talking at an event I was at once. And uh, he, he said, you know, it's no longer good enough to have a digital strategy. You've got to have a strategy, strategy that's digital. And it's stuck with me ever since. I mean, this is going back five, six years. And I think the same applies to digital marketing strategies. That, that, that sort of blurred line between you know, sales and marketing and the two sort of sitting very far apart, you know, the, the companies that are really able to entwine that, to me, have been the companies that have been super successful over this period. And I think that's something which you guys have done particularly well. If you're looking at other things that have allowed you to, to um, you know, weather the storm, as we said, when we were in, you know, in the eye of the needle last, uh, you know, last summer, to then have what I understand is it was a really strong end to the year and a very strong pipeline for Q1. And, and I know how confident you are about 2021 and the numbers there. What do you think are some of the contributors to, to that happening for you? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a good question, right? And I, and I think we, you know, again, there was this whole adjustment last year. How do you, how do you engage with people when potentially they're struggling, their family's struggling, the, the, they were trying to restructure? If you think back, because it did get, was quite dark in in kind of q2 last year and you yeah, know and, and you kind of felt a little bit crass if you were sort of trying to sort of do big some sales push or or get yeah. people punchy about it right so so it was difficult i think one of the one of the things that really attracted me to to rapid edition and why, why i enjoy working here is the quality of some of the people we've, we've well the quality of all the people but in terms of the quality of 
certain key individuals, given their financial experience and knowledge and the organizations they've, they've come out on out of on the client side um, and their deep technical domain knowledge means that um, we've been really able to engage with clients as, you know, on a more consultative type discussion. So even where projects have slowed down or decisions have got deferred or, um, you know, maybe it's an existing a client with no new, new sale on the horizon, our ability just to kind of work with those guys, give them advice, help them extract the most value from services they maybe already take from us. Or if they had been talking to us about a, a, a project and it's, it's kind of been pushed out, um, you know, carry on providing them in, input and design ideas and thinking about how they might solve problems within their, their business without being too pushy on, on the sales. So this sort of whole consultative, you know, we can help you, you, um, you know, don't, don't worry, we'll work with you on this, this kind of approach. And I think that's really resonated and, and, you know, that's now paying dividends in, in terms of the projects people are inviting us into, or particularly around existing clients where, you know, we've done good stuff with them in the past. We, we've kind of been helpful during that, that sort of fallow period. But that's led to them saying, well, you know, maybe you can help us with this and kind of new project stuff that um, that's kind of come out of left field a bit and, and even slightly tangential to what we traditionally have done and said, well, actually, you know, could you do this as well? And we're saying, well, yeah, that, that's that's pretty adjacent. That's a natural extension of what we do. And we're, we're lucky because the platform we we offer is, is, is very flexible from that perspective, right? So you yeah. can adapt it to all sorts of different electronic trading workflow um, message types and so on. So, it, it, you know, it kind of lends itself to that. Um, so I think that was key. I think, I think the other thing that, that's become an increasing, a beacon stroke bugbear for me, um, the, the more we talk to clients, the more I see them kind of held back by a lot of the, the sort of legacy, slightly closed technology. And I, I don't know whether it's um, because it's dated tech, that it struggles to um, be interoperable with other technology or, mm. or whether some executives at, at, at certain tech firms are, you know, concerned that if they open up their, their business model, they'll, they'll lose out. But, you know, I do feel a lot of clients getting hold, held back in terms of things they want to do and the markets, you know, the world's changing rapidly around them, but they're sort of stuck on this quite fixed, technology that is you know maybe you know not the easiest to work with or doesn't have a policy of kind of uh, inter interfacing to you know in lots of other different types of, of technology and vendors um, and that's kind of putting a real handbrake on um, the ability to to you know well innovate yes but it, but even kind of adapt and change with with the market for for all the clients right so so I think that, that that's kind of interesting and and part of our philosophy that's almost been reinforced as, as, as we have these discussions is while I can understand why people might do that at, at the same time I think over the long term that's a poor strategy for an organization because mm. the world we're going to and you know I know you speak to Steve uh, Grobler and he likes this this uh, phraseology the the composable enterprise but I think for the capital markets industry from a te technology perspective technology or technology and data perspective to be able to kind of not only survive but but sort of thrive going forward this sort of shift towards being able to plug together best of breed components that are open flexible interoperable is is kind of really key for where we're going and i see a lot of fantastic new kind of companies emerging that offer that kind of capability and i think there's a bit of friction in the industry at the moment that a lot of the in incumbent vendors are, are you know there's quite a, quite a lot of old tech out there doing a good job and i don't, I don't want to be critical because i think you know at the time that was the technology available and people wanted this sort of you know one stop shop for cer for certain things but the world's moved on and yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think there's a bit of friction in the industry now. So how how do we how do we kind of navigate around that? How do we how do we solve that issue, um, and get to a world where actually you can work with with banks to sort of plug together very com compatible technologies that enable the bank to do what it it wants, or the asset manager, or the or the or the new liquidity platform um, to kind of evolve and come out with new innovative business models because 
yeah, they need to differentiate. There's a lot of um, upside in our industry through uh, what's happening at the moment. If you look at, you know, capital markets, we're starting to see um, more more automation, electronification of areas like fixed income. Uh, we're starting to see um, cryptocurrency initially, but hopefully more broadly asset digitization really start to get traction with institutional investors. So there's some exciting things happening out there, but you need that kind of enabling technology to, to help that happen. So, so that, that, that's going to be an interesting battleground over the coming couple of years, I think. I think, I think it's been uh, without question a battleground. And, and, but what's really encouraged me over the last, last year, I think in particular, is the acceleration of uh, mindsets and openness to you know, that, that sort of uh, buffet style sort of service, isn't it? Of, of, of what, what, what sort of really works for that particular individual. And that sort of choice, I think, has been, has been great to see because, yeah, you're right, that, that's the bastion of the enterprise, um, you know, saying that leg legacy technology here. Uh, and we were talking about this yesterday, you know, there's, there's not all legacy tech is necessarily a bad thing, but as Steve sort of uh, intimated himself, it's not necessarily a good thing either. I think this is all down to tailored to efficiency. Efficiency has been probably the biggest gain that we'll, we'll see in this last year of companies, you know, use this, phrase, this phrase a lot last time and I've been using it ever since. It's sort of become an obsession of mine. And I've, it's, it's come up in books. Like, you know, like when, you, when you see a, a car that you want to buy and you see it every two seconds, I think friction reduction was something you spoke about a lot last time that we spoke. Uh, and I've been reading about it and, I, and I've been reading a lot of books about Amazon and Netflix in particular. Uh, and you'll hear about Amazon looking at friction reduction. You hear Netflix looking at friction reduction in customer experience. That friction reduction in in capital markets about how we can make this as efficient as possible for people to be doing as much as they possibly can is the driving and overwhelming agenda for for everyone uh, in the marketplace at the moment. How can you do more with less? How can you make everything as efficient as possible? How can uh, you know e even down to how often you fly or what events you go to or how you can do things? This is all about making sure we are as super efficient as we possibly possibly can be. And I think. You know, again, going back to those golden threads of companies within that, those who are looking to, um, and I love, I, you know, I've become more and more obsessed with interoperability and how things can link up. And we're doing it even in our tech suite, um, you know, more significantly in our tech suite at the moment. We're looking at how we can make sure that every person's job in, in, in our business is going to be that much easier than it was before. How can we make sure that, that we can get more profitability out of every individual and not necessarily have a team that is, uh, as fat as it has been at various different stages, but how can we get it? As, and, and within that, the retention of every individual who's, who's within that is, it, you know, um, becomes so much easier because everyone's winning and being successful and doing an easier job. And, and to do more with less, I think, is one of those key sort of things of, of businesses that are allowing that to happen. Uh, and it's very much, as I say, something which sort of stuck with me from our conversation, one of the most memorable things of all the 110 that I did last, last year if I can pick out something that I think was you know, really stood out to me, it's that that sort of uh, real focus on on customer friction reduction that has to come from exactly what you've just been speaking about and saying, right, how can we pull in X and Y and Z? And we did a panel last last year um, where we were talking you know, with Glue42 and Velox and, and yourselves. And, uh, and I thought it was a really interesting discussion there about you know, the importance of of interoperability and and uh, and working together to provide a suite of solutions that really um, move the needle and, and move things further forward for the customer and and that you know that alongside uh, strong sales based on trusted advisor relationships based on strong marketing and, and value that's being brought to it with a proposition there that is agile as you've just been talking about as well probably ties into exactly why you're on the list <laughs> and. Uh, and, and why the business has been able to, uh, you know, to, to, to be cheesy about this, not just survive the, you know, the last 12 months, but really start to put themselves in a position to thrive from it. I think that pause, reflect um, and improve has been something which is, you know, which is what I, I always think massively uplift, uplifting and wonderful to see. And the privilege for me over the course of this year's FinTech Focus TVs has been speaking to people there who've, who've been able to turn the negative situation and really uh, improve their, their headcount, improve their revenue, improve their turnover, and, and almost every single aspect of the business has become better because of what's happened. And if that can be a lasting legacy for the industry, then everyone's happy, right?
Yeah. Let's uh, let's 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 finish, uh, Mike, by talking about yeah you know, the future. Let's talk. Let's look at 2021 because this is a list for 2021, and it's uh, the companies there that are doing. You know, the 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 Q for the judges, the MO for the judges was to say right, what's what's happening with companies there that are exciting, that are doing uh, cool things, that are really going to going to light up the, the the year and be companies that people should be looking at and, and engaging with. So let's look at that for for rapid addition. Tell me what's exciting this year, what your priorities are, and what, what 2021 looks like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe one way to have that conversation is to look, obviously I can't talk about specific clients, but when I, when I look at the pipeline and, and the sales opportunities and discussions we're having at the moment, I, I, I think it, it, it's, it's quite an interesting kind of view of what's going on in the industry. So if I talk about the, the types of opportunities, right? So they're, they're very broad and they range everything from kind of big big buy side firms who uh, want to maybe embrace fix more and automate more of their processes and kind of join up their organization and drive efficiencies where I think up until now that had been you know, focus has been very much on on the sell side and you know the, the sort of margin pressure they'd been under and following kind of waves of regulation post the credit crisis right so so I think change is happening in, in the buy side and they're uh, looking more at in, investing in, in technology and how they can um, drive efficiencies and automate end-to-end -end workflow in, in sort of very traditional types of businesses. All the way through to kind of more fintech type opportunities where you know, we've, we've got a couple of conversations going on in um, the distributed ledger technology space. Um, yeah. We've got a couple of um, startup firms who are um, looking at kind of new liquidity models and they want, want to create a, a, a kind of platform. We can't go into it too much, but, but you know, kind of more new idea, new, new entity kind of kicking off. And, and then on, on some kind of core, core businesses, like sort of sell side people, uh, you know, it's a bit, a bit of a 2.0 where um, perhaps the conversation we were having before around being on very kind of solid, but perhaps a little legacy tech without wanting to be too rude and now feeling kind of restricted around what they want to do next and perhaps the, the client onboarding experience isn't that great, et cetera. Um, and, and looking kind of to upgrade um, on TRA platform um, to, to kind of to, to change up a gear and, um, uh, you know, be, be able to accelerate their business and, and, and be more attractive. So, kind of very, very broad um, set of opportunities for us, um, which, you know, which is encouraging because I think the whole industry is, is looking at how does it operate more efficiently, but at the same time, you've got new business models, new, new players emerging. So yeah, kind of rich, um, rich set of opportunities, which is, which is great for RA and, and obviously I'm very happy about. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I think it's also, yeah, it's kind of indicative of, you know, why I'm quite optimistic about the industry in general and um, some of the change that, that's now happening. I think people have sort of got to the point where they can't extract any more cost efficiency out of, out of current processes. So therefore, they need to change the processes, right? And uh, to do that, they're, they're obviously going to be looking at, at technology solutions and the sort of partners that can help them do that. And, uh, you know, obviously, we're doing our best to position ourselves as, as, as being one of those firms. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic. Um, you know, we've been through a kind of tough time, but as we kind of come out of the pandemic and sort of new world order or whatever you want to call it, um, yeah, I, I am cautiously optimistic about our industry. I think there's a lot of, a lot of change, a lot of dynamism going on and, and, and new business models being created. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited um, about the future. And I think for us, look, looking at those opportunities and the discussions we're having at the moment, the wheels are really beginning to move in the industry. And, and, and uh, I think that looks great for us and, and I'm sure a lot of other firms as well. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I, think I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and, and uh, there are catalysts, aren't there, for, for change? And, and uh, you know, Y2K probably saw, for, you know, for numerous reasons, and uh, yeah, particularly that sort of uh, rapid electronification of markets etc mm. you know that, that, that huge flurry of activity of innovation around 2000 to 2005 and then this sort of pause for, for, for the last 15 years ago again we were talking about this yesterday and and this as a um, you know lubricant for, for rapid change 
in the marketplace, that sort of petrol on the bonfire, as, as has been spoken about a few times now, for, for digital transformation within the industry that has allowed other areas to, to race ahead. And again, I've pointed back to and cited uh, e-commerce as a, as, and retail as, as an industry that's completely been beaten the financial markets in terms of its ability to adopt a digital um, you know, opportunity. This to me seems like we're going to see we're going to see uh, five years plus of of very accelerated innovation and, and real opportunities to improve and enhance. And I think with that, you'll see a market that, that you know, a general markets, exchanges that, that, that should have probably been hampered more by what's happened, that will probably stay fairly robust. And, and I know that's famous last word because it, for every every speculator that said that the market's going to keep uh, keep sturdy, there's a load that are saying we, we've, uh, we've, with all the uh, stimulus that's been put in there, we're heading for a, a, a disaster. But I'd be very, you know, and with, as you said, you know, crypto and, and you know, new asset class, as, you know, as a genuine new asset class coming in, it's very, very interesting to see this is, you know, I don't think there's anyone who's got a complete set of eyes on what's, what, what comes next and quite what it means for, uh, for economics and such like. But I think it's certainly an exciting time for technology and, and, it, and its evolution. Yeah, and I, and I think at a minimum, it's going to be volatile, right? So yeah. um, there is a lot of, you know, QE and stimulus packages being, you know, trillions of dollars being invested by, by governments. Um, the, as, as you said, you know, if you look at the real economy, there's so much change in, in consumer habits. So yes, there's been losers and, you know, you probably wouldn't want to be running an airline at the moment, but there's definitely been winners. Um, you, might, you might want to be buying one now, though. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a bit of pent up, <laughs> which, which again, you know, I think is going to be Good, good for kind of corporate sector. Um, there's a lot of pent up demand. There's a lot of enforced savings. Where, um, although I'm looking at my balance bank balance over there, I'm not quite sure where, where the savings. Are. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's what the kids are eating like. more stuff at home. <laughs> yeah, exactly, but, uh, exactly, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, you know, so, so I think I think it's going to be very interesting economically. Um, and and I was uh, you know I was watching the budget yesterday, and there's some you know whatever you think of it, but I was quite excited by some of the um, in innovation and investment being put into things like Freeport, you know, infrastructure, uh, yeah. green projects, and so on, because I think that's you know it's going to drive you know, economic activity, and um, that that's got to be good, right? So well, that, that ties into the the, you know, the Khalifa report and and everything that's sort of pointing there towards a, a sort of very exciting time, particularly for UK fintech as well, isn't it? So yeah, you've got a strong and, and helpful budget. Um, and I do think it is a helpful budget for you know for 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 what's happened. And I think there's been a you know for for everything that's been pilloried over the last year about what hasn't been done or what has been done. Actually, the the, the sort of I think the UK government has done an exceptional job at you know with the economy over that that sort of period in, in hugely unprecedented and challenging sort of times. Yeah. I think it sort of remains, despite Brexit, a, a you know a, a lot that's been pushed in there to to drive. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's been very much seen by the government as the the uh, jewel in the crown is the is the tech and UK fintech scene, which is encouraging as well. So so as you say, plenty of things there in in the melting pot that make exciting viewing. I think for 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 this as a as a capital for for fintech growth, and I'm and I'm so pleased that you guys have done a great job on it over the last year, and are set up to uh, to really thrive through 2021. So, uh, viva la revolution! I think we can probably end by saying. <laughs> yes indeed that would be that would be great you know i think uh as i said exciting times and um yeah we shall see but uh you know touch wood so far so good and and i'm pretty optimistic about the next 12 months and beyond so um looking forward to it absolutely mike it's always a pleasure talking to you um uh, as, as i say congratulations on the listing congratulations on on the year and how it started so so far for people who are watching this and want to get in touch the best way of, of doing that i assume uh the website's a good place to start, but anywhere else that you, anyone who should be talking to you and where can they reach you? Well, do do reach out to me directly. You can get me on LinkedIn, but uh, otherwise go to the website and all our details are there. And of course, we'd love to, love to speak to you. And thanks very much, Toby. It's been a, been a great discussion. Loved it. And uh, we hope you've been loved it as well. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching again. Mike, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.